So I noticed that lots of people were showing videos. So I'm going to show you video two, uh, so you remember who I am. And let me tell you, this is not a simulation. This is real. And so um, I am kind of a uh, disruptive thinker. And uh, I started flying gliders when I was 14. And then I discovered a uh, lightweight glider that is lighter than I am. And I'm not a heavyweight model myself. Um, that thing is actually foot launchable. Um, I will not do that. I'm too old for that. Um, but this is absolutely high tech. There's only one of its kind. It's a fairly high performance glider for the fact that it is uh, only 65 kilos uh, total weight. And um, here you see a bungee launch that I did in, uh, in September. Um, <coughs> so the, the, the thinking that goes throughout uh, lots of uh, work that I do is um, I like things really lightweight and simple. So with that, I, uh, uh, I will talk about microservers. Uh, we started uh, looking at microservers uh, a couple of uh, years ago. And uh, about one year ago in February, we were able to attract uh, funding from the Dutch government for uh, an IBM team in Zurich Research with um, Astron, which is a world-renowned radio astronomy uh, institute in the Netherlands, um, in a project that is called DOME, where we are doing technology roadmap development for the SKA project. Uh, SKA is a square kilometer array. Uh, they're building a single instrument that has a total collecting area of one square kilometer or a million square uh, meters. Um, and the raw data that is being sampled at the antennas is going to be 14 exabytes per day when this thing is in operation and it will uh, generate data that people want to keep in the order of a petabyte per day uh, when it's operational in 2024. Today we don't know how to build this instrument in a cost-effective way, um, but this is a uh, big data on steroids program. Uh, the data needs to be sampled, transported, analyzed, stored and retrieved all in real time. And only when you get the final petabyte per day, you want to you wanna store this. There's simply no way to store intermediate results. It's just way too much. Uh, the, the processing that is being done is basically beam forming and correlation. So that's really large FFTs. Um, so it's a, it's a signal processing. Now why they do this is basically to look at the Big Bang. We heard about this yesterday. Uh, if you uh, build a really sensitive antenna, you can look all the way out to the, uh, uh, the first few years after the Big Bang and study the uh, epoch of reionization. So within that, uh, that realm, we uh, were able to find funding to build a research demonstrator. So I am a research guy. Uh, I look very far out into the future. And um, one of the things I do is figure out how to build uh, future data centers. And um, that will take some time to figure out how to do that. And then the microserver disruption came along and I said, I have, to, I have to do something. So I gave myself the task to build the world's highest density 64-bit microserver drawer. And uh, it's useful for both SKA radio astronomy, but also for IBM future capability. It should have a very high energy efficiency. Look at it as kind of a data center in a box. It must be true 64-bit to enable business applications. And um, the choice that we had, uh, that we made given all the available technology was actually a 64-bit PowerPC done by Freescale. It is built for the embedded market. And um, I also need to tell you what my definition is of a microserver. So there's tons of definitions. My definition is you integrate the entire compute node motherboard with the acceptance of DRAM and Norboot Flash all onto a single chip that is an SOC. And the, this definition of microserver does not really say that you need to do something with very low performance cores. 
right? In fact, the part that Freescale is building is uh, very high performance, but they're built for a different market. And um, so I actually carry my microserver in my pocket. So this is a, this is the one of the first boards that we're building. Uh, it's a little bit larger than a uh, memory DIM board. The memory DIMs are like this tall. And uh, this is a true 64-bit server that I carry in my, in my pocket. Um, so here you see the, the sizes. Um, this is the pictures of the first uh, board. Uh, we basically said we want really low cost, so let's use a DIM connector because that's only a dollar. And across the DIM connector, we then redefine all of the signals. So no longer you know, DDR3 signals. Basically, we have a bunch of Ethernet, SATA, uh, SD card interface, USB interface, and various power levels. And uh, this is the, uh, the chip from Freescale that we're using for the first, uh, is there a pointer on here? Yes. So uh, basically, this is a system on a chip, right? You've got uh, uh, all of your Ethernets here. There's SATA here, uh, USB, uh, all of the stuff that you need to get a, a server running. This is a two-core version, 64-bit. And um, uh, this is a diagram of the noteboard we're building. So you see it's fairly simple. Uh, the system on the chip, two DRAM channels, uh, SPI flash so it can boot, a control uh, processor to allow JTAG, serial, I2C, I power sequencing uh, that's controlled through USB, and then we have multiple Ethernets, SD card, SATA across the, uh, the SD interface. And, oh, these colors are really bad. So. Um, this part is actually built for the embedded market, so there was, at the time we started working on this, no real uh, uh, business 64-bit OS available. So we started to work with, uh, with a couple of people on, uh, on this issue, and then we got uh, all of this stuff that you see on this slide uh, working. That actually was a, a fairly big challenge. <laughs> this is really unreadable. Um, it turns out that, that IBM and Freescale uh, are working on the same architecture book of PowerPC called 1.3, but there's two versions within that, which is book S and book E for server and embedded. And if you load a kernel, which is done by, for instance, Red Hat for 64-bit PowerPC, and you try and make that run on the embedded processor, it simply doesn't work. You, you probably even kill the device. Um, I don't know exactly why people made that decision. Uh, it was done a long time ago, and uh, that actually uh, required a major work to get things working. So uh, we were able to get Fedora 17 running on, uh, on a demonstration system. And here you see uh, this part uh, working. Um, that effort actually took only about one day once people figured out how to, how to do this. And then uh, I continued on to, uh, to do for me a real milestone uh, by having the capability to run DB2. So IBM 64-bit DB2, the complete product without compilation, is running on a bar like this, right? Uh, that is a significant uh, disruption. Um, <coughs> to make sure that we, uh, that we can cover a couple of things, we then went on to, here you see a demonstration of the, uh, um, the workload driver. So IBM has a workload driver package that allows you to stimulate through a web uh, PHP interface the, uh, the whole database engine. And here you see a transaction over time that is actually running. And the system has been up and running stably for months. So that's, uh, that's really good. Uh, we then also installed Hadoop. We did this, of course, in the pseudo distributed mode. Uh, here you see a screenshot of a Hadoop job in, in progress. And uh, since we also uh, in Zurich Research Lab have the home of CPMD, so Carpernello Molecular Dynamics, we also ported this one, which was uh, interesting because that is actually written in uh, G-Fortran and GCC. Um, and we did about uh, a native compile in 50 minutes of 100k lines of Fortran, uh, no issues, and it just runs. Here's a screenshot. The most important part about this screenshot is Somebody mentioned command line interfaces yesterday. This is, you know, fantastic uh, GUI here, right? 
Uh, but the most important part is this here, where you say, well, what does that mean? 256 dot and then many O's. Um, that is actually a number that uh, is only correct when the floating point unit actually works. So when it is truly uh, IEEE compliant. So the fact that, that it runs is great, but it also generates the right results on this part. Um, so the conclusion at this point is that server class 64-bit OS uh, with um, applications has arrived on commodity PowerPC SOCs. Um, now, <coughs> these boards are fairly high performance, and um, the TDP that we have for, for this board, for instance, is 70 watts, right? So, and we're going to stack these things as closely together as the DIM connector allows, so no space for uh, big cooling uh, sinks, right? So we borrow the work that, uh, that is done in our lab for the Supermark uh, machine, uh, which is installed in, uh, in Munich. That's why it's called uh, MUC, that's the airport code. And uh, this machine allows to get a PoE that is really low, 1.1. Uh, you actually save about 40% uh, of the energy and you can actually reuse the, the waste heat if you use hot water cooling. So it sounds paradoxical to many people, but you can actually use hot water to cool chips even uh, maintaining an 85 degree junction temperature if you engineer all of the, uh, uh, the packaging in the right way. And uh, we leverage this, and so what we are going to build uh, by uh, early next year is a drawer that, that kind of looks like this, where we have water cooling coming in, going out, with manifolds across uh, metal fingers that, that come from the pipes, and then the cards just uh, slide in, and there's uh, uh, cooling plates that go all across the, uh, the front and the back of these, uh, these boards to get the, the heat out. This allows us to get basically uh, a couple of hundred note boards in a, a 2U form factor, um, so we get hundreds of cores, uh, we get uh, around two terabytes of uh, DRAM in this system, and basically I look at this is this is like a commodity-based blue gene queue, right? We use only commodity components here, and we get uh, a fairly impressive uh, level of performance. Um, so the status of the project is that um, <coughs> We started uh, February a year ago when we got the, uh, the contract signed by the Dutch government. Uh, we then selected a 45 nanometer part from Freescale called the P5040. It's a four core uh, device that runs at 2.2 gigahertz as a 64 bit floating point unit. Um, for risk mitigation, since uh, there was only first silicon available for this part, we then choose the 5020, which is a two core version of the same thing, pin compatible. Uh, capability to uh, build the first uh, prototype. As mentioned, we got the entire software uh, stack uh, solved with DB2, Hadoop, CPMD, and uh, then I was at the Austin lab at uh, December last year, and uh, we got the entire same software stack running successfully on their latest 28 nanometer part, which is a 12 core, 64 bit, uh, runs at 1.8 gigahertz per core, three memory channels, uh, T4240 uh, system on a chip that has also faster Ethernet capability and uh, is, is a really interesting part. Um, <coughs> so we got the first uh, note boards, of, of which I have a sample in my hand. Uh, and the first eight-way cluster that is going to validate also the whole cooling concept, the whole packaging uh, is planned in the next couple of months. We have actually completed a uh, feasibility study to put the, the 4240 on the same form factor with three memory channels. So that will be 24 gigabytes of, of DRAM. So we will have uh, basically 12 cores, 64-bit, and 24 gigabyte of DRAM on a part like that with plenty of networking capability across the, uh, the connector. Um, that, that design will start in the next couple of weeks. 
and then we have the uh, the 19 inch uh, two year drawer plan for the, the first quarter of uh, 2014. Um, so I try to maintain a, uh, a micro web server based on the demonstration system that you can actually uh, see running. It's a very simple web page only, but uh, there's proof that this, uh, this, this thing to work. Um, final chart is that uh, the performance of this, uh, this T4240 is actually uh, nothing to be sneezed at. Uh, that part runs at two thirds of the performance of an IBM P7 chip. However, at much lower power and at much lower cost. It's a commodity part, right? And then just a list of uh, people that made all of this, uh, this work. And that was my last slide. I guess we got time for quick questions if there's any. You know, what's the balance between the research aspect and kind of the pre product aspect and the way IBM works? I mean, when you start this, do they really have relatively firm commitment to turning this into a, the data center in a box eventually? Do you need that commitment to proceed? How does it work? Well, uh, I, cannot, I cannot speak to any kind of uh, commitment from, uh, from IBM product uh, division. Uh, I can only say that you know, we are in discussions. Automated screen or sure. Thank you. You just plug this guy in here. There's no memory to, the, uh, to it. Yes. Do you have any plans for putting GPM back? You have to work just copy and stuff right now. <laughs> Um, yes, finally we want to, uh, to try out uh, the, the HPC capability of this, right? So I mentioned it's a blue gene queue uh, based on commodity parts and GPFS on this would be also be uh, uh, very desirable. Yes. Okay, thanks.